Our first speaker, um, architect Adrian Smith. As you all know, he doesn't need uh, much introduction, but uh, since this is an uh, official um, uh, speaker uh, speech time, so I'll give a brief introduction. Adrian Smith has been a practicing architect over 40 years. He's an extraordinary body of work, including some of the world's most recognizable landmark structure, including the Buzz Khalifa in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, currently, the world's tall, tallest structure, as you all know. Project under his design direction has won over 100 major awards for design excellence. Uh, Mr. Smith will deliver uh, the presentation named uh, The Evolution of an Idea, which I believe will show the evolution and the refinement of architectural continuum that includes only tripedal designs by uh, Ms. Vanderoe as a historical reference. Please welcome uh, Mr. Adrian Smith with your applause. Thank you very much. Um, I first started thinking about this uh, idea uh, back in the late 90s when we were starting to do a project called uh, Tower Palace 3 here in uh, Seoul. And um, it actually went back to a time when I was looking out of our window when I was at SOM uh, out of the Santa Fe building and looking across to see and looking at the, uh, uh, the uh, Lake Point Tower that was done by Shipwright and Heinrich, and um, coming up with an idea for the competition entry to that project. Uh, I noticed that building, and I started to uh, study it a little bit further. Uh, going back to uh, its precedent, which was the Friedrichstrasse competition project by Mies van der Rohe, I found out a little bit more about uh, Mies uh, in uh, investigating that project. Uh, for example, uh, Mies was not always a uh, modern architect. He, he worked in a more traditional style until roughly 1918, 1919, when he bought his first Kandinsky and put it up in his living room. And uh, I guess that gave him inspiration and uh, moved him into the genre of modern architecture. And then shortly after that, he met a developer who owned the piece of land uh, near the Friedrichstrasse train station in Berlin. And this piece of property was a triangular site. And this developer had just gotten back from New York and had talked about how fantastic New York was at the time and how uh, important the high rise uh, played in the, in the density and the, the excitement and the atmosphere and the quality that it was exhibited in New York at that time. And I would also add Chicago and other cities at that time. But um, he came back to Berlin and stated to a, a number of uh, architects that were entering this competition that he wanted something on this site that was light and not heavy like all of the other architecture was uh, at the time, which was basically solid masonry walls, lots of load-bearing structure on the exterior, small windows. Uh, he, he expressed a desire to have lightness and airiness and uh, uh, a very much different quality to the building. And so out of that came the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper competition and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe's uh, uh, scheme for that project. And here is his, uh, here is his drawing for the scheme. And when I was talking with... Uh, uh, George Shipwright about this concept. He said it was really at a very conceptual level. There was no structure uh, to the building and it was a, an idea about how to play with light on the surfaces of the of the building and the skin and the idea of, of glass planes uh, were, were developed on this building. And the interesting aspect about this is that at the time they didn't really have air conditioning so to do an all-glass building uh, was challenging from the point of view of how do you air condition it, how do you heat it, how do you keep it comfortable during uh, most of the parts of the year. And of course, uh, 
this building didn't get built, and it's that site is still relatively empty as far as I know. I was back in Germany uh, a few years ago, and I saw the site, and it was still uh, still empty. But this competition um, brought about a number of points that are important in our architecture today. One of them is the uh, to free the exterior walls from uh, load-bearing structure, and another one is to uh, make the exterior wall as transparent as possible, uh, to build uh, a building without a structure or decorative frame of masonry. That was another one of the uh, competition guidelines, apparently. Uh, the form of the building actually derived from the triangular site of the tower. And this building proposed a center core for all of its elevatoring and services, although very crude at the time. And there's the floor plan. That's as far as Mies got in terms of uh, floor plan for this building. As you can see, it, it conforms to the site relatively, but it's actually broken up into three buildings that are interconnected with a core. And uh, one of my last projects that I'll show you, and I'm showing, I'm going to show you about ten projects here that have been influenced by, uh, indirectly or directly by this project that I've been involved in. There is the model, uh, a massing model uh, for an exhibit that somebody did showing the triangular building flat top, just uh, extruded form, but very crystalline in its character and nature. Um, move forward to Chicago in 1966, 67, 68, uh, with Shipwright and Heinrichs building uh, for Lake Point Tower. This building, when it was built at 70 floors and 627 meters or feet, sorry, uh, was the world's tallest concrete building. And the original idea for Lake Point Tower, I I assumed that he he was directly influenced by Friedrichstrasse. Uh, when I talked to him, however, though, he said, no, he wasn't directly influenced, but he was, that idea was around, and he worked for Mies van der Rohe uh, before he started his own firm, and he, um, he was influenced by the idea of a freestanding, free-floating building, but not specifically to that. Um, and, in fact, he said the first original idea for Lake Point Tower was a four-legged tower, uh, and that that was uh, in the process of trying to reduce area to reduce cost of the building, uh, changed to a three-legged structure, which was probably a, a better thing for this building because it uh, it helps the uh, exterior wall have better views, more privacy from each unit. Uh, in each of these, I'll go through a structural slide that just demonstrates that there's a strong structural evolution uh, to this idea as well as these buildings get taller. And most of these buildings actually have a similar size footprint. Some are slightly longer, some are not, but uh, in Lake Point Tower, this is the footprint of the tower. It was surprisingly simple with a center sure core walls with link beams connecting the three walls and uh, a series of uh, concrete columns and uh, flat plate construction extruded all the way up. Um, but the brilliance of it was that with these central corridors down the three legs, you get everything has double loaded. Uh, it's very efficient from the point of view of a residential structure. Very good plan from that. And just to show you the uh, original idea that he had was a square, square core and a cruciform structure. Um, the skin was a typical uh, Mies van der Rohe skin at that time, developed really by Mies in 52 for 880, 860 Lakeshore Drive. Here it has tinted glass, uh, double glazing here uh, with operable windows and a uh, induction unit on the perimeter so that you can get fresh air for every unit uh, right at the exterior of wall and you can control the air conditioning from your room. So that was a fairly standard thing at the time, but uh, worked very well with glass buildings. Um, the three-legged plan provides for very efficient residential layout around the double-loaded corridor and the central service corridor. And here it is in plan. It's The idea was to set it in, the, in a park. Even though it's on a podium, the top uh, roof of this podium is all beautifully landscaped uh, 
and designed by a landscape designer named Alfred Caldwell. So go to 2003. Uh, this is uh, Tower Palace 3, which I was the design partner on while at Skidmore and Merrill. SOM was the structural engineer, also the mechanical engineer, but I've, I basically just talk about architecture and structure here, so I didn't go through a complete list of attributions, but um, Tower Palace 3, at the time it was built, I believe, was Korea's tallest structure. Uh, I'm not sure which one is taller at the moment here, uh, but originally this building was planned to a height of 42 floors uh, with three legs that stepped, and at the top it, it was going to have roughly 15 floor increments, so it would have looked a little uh, quite a bit different than it looks now as it terminates uh, at the top of the building. And the serrated facade uh, with the clear glass of this tower recalls the crystalline nature of uh, the Friedrichstrasse concept, uh, however much, much taller. Uh, this shows the original design for Tower Palace III. Uh, it's Y-shaped plan hasn't changed, but the uh, the way in which it terminates was uh, brought down to 73 stories from its original 92-story concept. And um, the center core here has three major rectangular structural box core extensions. Uh, the perimeter columns um, and floor framing on this building uh, were done in steel. We looked at it both in concrete and steel, but at the time, uh, it was just after one of the collapses of a couple of structures here in Seoul. Uh, concrete was being questioned as uh, a building material, and in terms of marketing this building, it was made a decision was made to go with steel framing rather than concrete. Uh, the serrated edges of this building uh, perform a number of purposes. One is that the cantilevers provide column-free space. Another one is that we've located vertical air handling units uh, for each unit uh, at, the, uh, at the cantilevered portion so that we get uh, fresh air directly from the unit from each, um, each air handling unit as well. And the third is that it provided for uh, interior exterior balconies that could, uh, could be expanded at a later date. Uh, wind, tunnel wind tunnel studies were done of this project, uh, found that the serrated edges and the sort of roughness of the skin was beneficial from a wind tunnel perspective in helping to uh, reduce the impact of wind. And this is the model of the, uh, at that time, award-winning concept or uh, the competition-winning concept. And here it is today. Um, as you can see, the low rise, I won't go, I'll go through a lot of these fairly quickly because the time frame is shorter than uh, I'd anticipated. So um, the legs, as they drop off, those the roofs become terraces, the core gets smaller, and at the very top, uh, there's a figural piece that uh, represents a symmetrical form at the top of the building. Uh, a standard view out of uh, the tips of one of these buildings, column-free, cantilevered, with panoramic views. And it was Tower Palace Three that gave us the idea on Burj Khalifa from a plan point of view uh, uh, to uh, develop the idea of Tower Palace Three uh, where it stepped, this one stepped much, um, where Tower's Palace Three stepped only three times, uh, because Burj, Burj Dubai, Burj Khalifa, was planned to be much taller. At the time of the competition, it was um, 700 meters tall, um, and eventually we brought it up to 828 meters tall. But the concept uh, in form of this is the evolution of the three-legged plan and the stepped form of Tower Palace Three. Each leg now steps four times uh, in a spiraling clockwise pattern as it ascends towards the center of the tower, someplace around uh, uh, 160 floors, and then um, 
at the center, uh, the center then begins to change its axis, uh, still breaking down, down into pods of three that are continuing to step. So there's 27 steps in all. Um, and the steps provide sky terraces as well as uh, they provide plan changes that help uh, shed the vortex action of this building. And the stepping, it's very important to step this building in such a way that uh, it ultimately, the entire building feels like a spire. Um, the plan sections and elevations of this building, as you can see, are start out to be quite similar to uh, Tower Palace 3. Uh, very interesting planning geometry in this building where uh, the tips of the three legs start out as a fairly acute angle and then as they step back towards the center the legs get wider and the angle of the uh, point gets much flatter. So it, it's a very gentle transition from the bottom of the building up into the center core of the building which then gets flatter still as it ascends to its ultimate spire peak. Uh, the center structure, core walls, perimeter wall columns, and round columns, and the flat plate are all reinforced concrete in this building, which extend to a height of approximately 600 meters. Uh, the spire on this building uh, is all steel, and uh, the wall columns uh, are at nine meter centers that uh, create seri a series of cells as they step out towards the center. And this provides a very convenient location of structure to step back to as we ascend towards the top of the building. Uh, one of Bill Baker's diagrams of the structural system here, showing the core, showing the corridor as a, a wall structure also, I think he uh, named this uh, the buttress core, primarily because those um, those corridor walls and the sort of hammerheads out at the end are uh, are bracing that central core and as well as supporting the legs of the uh, tower. Uh, the ground floor at the base of the building, the legs actually extend out beyond the structure of the tower and attach to what I call satellite structures at the tips. Uh, these satellite structures are um, for hotel support amenities and office space. And at the center of each of the legs are three ventilated double wall entrance pavilions, one for the hotel, one for the residential, and one for the office that act as the entrances to the tower itself. Here you see uh, uh, a photograph of... Uh, one of the courtyard sort of entrances. This happens to be at the office level. And a plan at the base of the building where the structure is, uh, the usable floor plates are actually extended out quite a ways past the large circular columns that are there. And then you have the tower itself, the hotel, uh, working within the nine meter cells and uh, starting to step back here uh, on the bottom uh, your left hand side uh, and these steps uh, occur uh, at increasing intervals as they go up towards the tower of the spire. Uh, here's the uh, entrance pavilion again, a little closer view of it. Uh, it is an all clear building, a double glass wall, five foot in uh, 1.5 meters wide with uh, internally ventilated cavity and uh, solar shading that um, can adjust to the sun conditions. Also of note here, uh, from a sustainable point of view, is the 11-story office building to, it, to its side uh, also has solar shading, uh, horizontal solar shading to the building. And the residential floor plates step up and reduce in size as they go up. Here's the first uh, boutique office floor and then a few skyline views of the tower uh, with the entrance pavilion at night lighting up uh, like a lantern. Uh, the office lobby, uh, which is now, it's actually envisioned as, as one lobby space but became two lobby spaces once the hotel grew out into the uh, pavilion and 
the Armani Hotel took, put its bar at the, uh, at the third floor, which is just above the wood ceiling here. The uh, residential lobby is a similar structure, but has this wonderful Palenza sculpture that uh, uh, was placed in the in the lobby with a series of uh, uh, round discs that had wa have water dripping on them and make uh, very gentle, almost uh, Asian sounds as you walk through the space. Transition space in the lobby, going from the pavilion to the elevators. Uh, the elevator lobby, uh, typical floor lobbies at the uh, residential. Um, an example of the terraces at the top of the building. Each of these terraces have wind issues related to them. So um, the structure that you see in this uh, image is both a shading structure and a structure that helps to uh, reduce the impact of wind on the terrace uh, coming down from the tower of the building. And the top of the terrace is lit by uh, this, the perimeter uh, structure out at the edge of the tower. Uh, these are a few of the images looking at the, the typical um, health facilities. Each, uh, each of these amenity floors has a swimming pool, uh, shower facilities, exercise rooms and a lounge, and then at the top uh, three floors of the building, uh, we designed um, a uh, Magellus and a boardroom and an office for uh, Chairman uh, Alibar at the time. Uh, with And the, the main feature here is a, a stairway that is suspended by steel, uh, stainless steel rods, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, uh, granite steps. All of this was done while I was at SOM, uh, designed while I was at SOM. Nada Andrik uh, worked on the interiors here. Uh, Bill Baker, I think, worked on the structure on this, uh, on this particular stair as well as the building itself. Uh, as did uh, Ahmad, Ahmad Abdurzak, who uh, played a very important role here where he was. He started this project uh, as an associate partner working for Bill, and he was there right at the very beginning of the project. And then, uh, at the end of I think schematic design uh, and into design development, he uh, he left SOM and joined Samsung. And then uh, we w we were helpful in getting Samsung involved in the entire project uh, as the contractor. And so he continued on with Samsung and is now monitoring, monitoring the movement of the building for Samsung. So he's got a lot of history in this building, very exciting. Uh, in this view, I think uh, it's, uh, this is one area where you can really see the sort of spiraling character of the stepbacks as it goes up, as it ascends to the top. And then uh, a night lighting shot. From that, um, I did a project which uh, is hypothetical, uh, hypothetical tower, uh, which would be the first evolution of Burj Khalifa. This one was designed as a one kilometer tower, and I chose uh, Wolf Point in Chicago as its site. Um, and here, the idea was to see if we could simplify the uh, stepping that occurred at Burj, make it fewer steps, but then notch the steps so that every time it stepped, there was also a, a cantilevered notch uh, cutout element to help uh, with uh, vortex shedding. This was never tested through wind tunnel testing, but uh, um, it has led to uh, future ideas. There, there it would be in Chicago on Wolf Point side at one kilometer, looking down the river. Again, uh, all of these in a way, have a relationship to uh, Mises uh, Friedrichstrasse project. Uh, this particular one was using glass uh, with a dichroic skin and a, a geometry within the skin itself that gave uh, additional emphasis to the exterior structure or exterior wall. And the floor plan was much simpler, as you can see from this uh, the structure. 
Uh, and because it's taller, we brought the stairs out to the points of the tower to extend those um, corridor walls and get the structure out as far as we could to the to the point of the structure. Um, Nanjing Greenland, um, also done uh, while I was at SOM. Uh, this was a competition that we won in 2004. Uh, SOM was the structural engineer and the mechanical engineer as well. And uh, this building is a triangular tower uh, with a center core with services uh, at the center core. And the structure is also very important to this building in the, in the core itself. Uh, but it's a mixed-use complex of uh, commercial, office, and hotel. And it's all glass. Uh, however, the glass uh, in this tower is, exp is expressed um, where certain sections of this tower uh, in composition, the glass is faced in one direction, and certain sections it's faced in another direction so that we get a... Uh, change in texture and change in tone of the building as the sun moves around the building. Can't be on time, almost out. Um, here is the structure, composite structure, a few images. And you can see how the floor plan, uh, it's, it's like one of the pods of Friedrichstrasse. Wuhan Greenland Center is another competition which we won about four or five months ago. Uh, Wuhan Tower is now uh, in design development. Uh, this tower will be 606 meters in height uh, when completed and will be the third or fourth tallest building in China. It's hard to keep up. Um, its plan is triangular, uh, which is referential to Friedrichstrasse Tower, and its overall plan is smaller and its primary use is office, hotel, and residential. And there's a large club facility at the very top of the building. Uh, the, the elevator system contains four separate shuttle elevator systems here in this uh, building and three levels. Uh, there are three levels of vents uh, at quarter points on this tower to help uh, with the vort vortices. Vortex shedding, however, on this building is primarily through the uh, tapering of the tower with the rounding of the top and the rounding of the soft corners on the three legs. Uh, the wind pressure relief is minimal in terms of the uh, vents. There's a more or less current rendering of the tower. Um, and the structural conditions as we move up the building the building stepping back. Kingdom Tower uh, is now a, an announced project. We've actually been working on this tower for almost two years. In fact, a little more than two years. Uh, this tower will be the tallest building in the world when completed in roughly 2016, 2017. It's anticipated that it'll be built in a 63 to 65 month period of time. Uh, and the height will be somewhere over 1,000 meters. The uh, exact height is still secret. Uh, it contains offices, hotels, service apartments, residential condominium, public observatory, sky terraces, uh, a sky terrace, uh, and sky palaces at the very top. Uh, the continually Y-shaped form here uh, is uh, in plan. And at each leg of the Y, uh, slopes at different angles uh, so that they terminate at different points at the top. Uh, as you can see in this rendering, uh, each leg uh, terminates uh, at a slightly different point with the least angled uh, spire ending up being the, uh, the point of the tower. Uh, you can see here the general change in the floor plates as it goes up. Basically, the floor plate of 95% of this building stays the same, and it changes by about 6 to 8 inches at each floor at the points of, uh, at the points of the legs. And here, like the uh, Wolf Point Tower, the stairway is all the way at the end of the tower. Uh, general site plan of the building is uh, in a district which will have another 12 or 13 buildings uh, immediately surrounding it with a commercial mall. 
um, that will connect to the tower itself. And the west side of the tower, uh, east, west, and northwest, will also have water around them. Uh, this shows the general uh, nature of the structure, very similar to um, Burj Khalifa, except for the extension all the way out to the exterior wall with uh, the sort of stairway core anchoring it at the end. Uh, this is a photograph of the, of the finished model of the project and a series of renderings. This is what it looks like at the base uh, with large canopies that step, uh, step out from the exterior wall and house the uh, public spaces and uh, shade the drop-off areas. Uh, this it would be the uh, interior uh, residential lobby. There are, it's broken up into two separate areas. Uh, this is a third area where it's a private drop-off for, um, for the uh, uh, units at the very highest point of the building. Uh, and these are, the, these are our character sketches at uh, the moment in terms of public spaces throughout uh, the tower itself. Some two-story duplex units will be involved, will be included in the building. And here is the Sky Terrace, the one-time helicopter pad that uh, we found out nobody was interested in trying to land a helicopter on this pad, uh, <laughs> but uh, we liked it so much, and the client liked it, so we turned it into an outdoor Magellus uh, Terrace uh, uh, event. And you can see how the floors, floor plates step back. One of the interesting features here. Uh, is that in the soft zone in the center of each leg, uh, at least at, at every floor there is a terrace um, that, um, that makes the building uh, more interesting to look at. It gives the, the facade animation and character, and also it gives the units that aren't in the corner of the building uh, a, an extra feature to, to sell and rent. Uh, people always say about this building, uh, this shot, is it really going to happen like that? Are there really clouds like that in, uh, in Saudi Arabia? And I always point them to the image that we uh, have at uh, Burj Khalifa where when you're standing at the top of Burj Khalifa and you look down, you see the 70-story structures peeking up through the clouds a little bit and you see this really long shadow cast by Burj Khalifa on top of the clouds. It's really uh, a cool view. Uh, Run Dubai, and I'm running out of time here, but uh, Run Dubai is a project we were doing for uh, Sheikh Mohammed in, uh, in Dubai. Here was an idea of taking three triangular towers and tying them together with sky bridges and um, with a, a major base structure, uh, structure at the base that tied them all together. Uh, and this went as far as we were in design development. RWDI had done uh, uh, two or three wind tunnel tests on this project by the time it got uh, put on hold, and it was a viable structure. Uh, there were some dampening elements that were required at the top of two of the three tallest towers here, but the tallest one, the tallest leg was one kilometer, the shorter one was 840 meters, and the shortest one was 640 me 20 meters. So uh, this was a massive project uh, that um, was uh, very interesting because it actually, be these sky ter uh, trusses and terraces also acted as public spaces in the sky. So if you were in the buildings, you could come down the elevator to one of those terraces, you could transfer over to one of the other buildings, or you could have your public spaces in the sky at that point so that um, uh, there could be potentially rooftop gardens on these sky terraces as well, um, protected by uh, the surrounding context. Uh, and uh, this was Halverson at uh, Halverson and Partners was structural engineer on One Dubai. Uh, and then the Mile High Tower in 2008 was a study that I did with um, uh, a little consultation with Ahmed Abdul Razak in terms of 
how we could get a structure that would go a mile high. Uh, and the tower, this tower was an exercise in exploring the possibilities of designing that structure, uh, looking at elevator systems and usable floor plans, and a mixed use of uh, mixture of uses to create a sort of vertical city uh, in this tower. Um, and it was an evolution of the one Dubai concept. Uh, and bundling these three towers together with a ring of structure, and this ring of structure uh, was connecting the elevator cores that, that were local in nature uh, at each of these three uh, legs that were the usable space, and then the express systems for the elevators were located in the center, and they were braced to the ring and to the buildings at about every 30, 30 floors. And I'll just run through these very quickly to show you. We actually developed it to some level. And um, generated some perspectives of what that space could be like in between the ring and the central core that you see here and the space around that, maybe that could uh, maybe that could generate uh, power of some sort as well. And last but not least uh, is an ex another experimental structure that I worked on at Skidmore and Merrill called, we called it the XYZ Gateway. And this idea uh, was to be a mile high structure uh, over the intersection of the, of the Dan Ryan Expressway and Ohio uh, entrance to the city. And we had an idea that by the time something like this was built, there would probably be personal air vehicles available by, by everyone to uh, fly into their parking spot in the structure uh, instead of access it by car. And uh, so we theorized a, uh, uh, a coordinate type of uh, entry sequence and uh, the red red diagrams show you the entrance, and then uh, also theorized that this would could generate and establish new zoning patterns for the city. And here you have the ten buildings in their relative heights, each one, uh, with a pretty accurate floor plan of each. Thank you very much. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, it was really uh, interesting uh, to see the historical development and the reference from Ms. Van der Rohe, and especially Frank Roy Wright's uh, One Mile High, uh, conceived in Wisconsin, now being realized uh, by Adrian Smith in Saudi Arabia.